everybody, and welcome to the Cambridge University Press sponsored webinar using the Cambridge Latin course on Elevate. Uh, my name is Martha Altieri, and I, along with Jenny Blasi and Donna Gerard, will be your presenters for this evening's presentation. And this webinar this evening is going to focus on two main topics how to access the Elevate platform and also the various features of the student and teacher resources. So with that said, we'd also like to uh, point out to you uh, just some uh, housekeeping things. If you're having any kinds of uh, questions or problems, uh, just please make sure that you use the um, the, uh, the question and answer box that you can see off to the right. And then just um, if you'll just send it to all of us, we will try to answer your questions just as quickly as we can or when appropriate. Um, we're assuming you're not having any technical problems because you would have probably been saying something by now. Okay. So just to advertise what's coming, um, obviously tonight is already happening. Um, we are doing something a little more of something this year that we did last year. We're using um, the opportunity to tap a lot of our teachers who are in the classroom and have some great ideas to do some webinars for us. So um, through the rest of the year, with maybe one exception, we're not sure, um, we will have guest speakers on topics such as, you know, using CI and oral participation and then um, assessment based testing, I mean, standards based assessments um, and other issues that have come up or people have mentioned on Facebook. And if you have anything you're curious about, let us know. We may not be able to do it this year, but it would be good for us to know what topics people are hungry for. So. So we'd like to begin by just uh, pointing out some of the differences between fourth edition and, and fifth edition. Uh, this seems to be an, an ongoing struggle for, for just about everybody. Uh, where you get fourth edition versus fifth edition, and we know how confusing it can be. So we thought we would just take a moment and uh, talk a little bit about those of you who are using fourth edition, where do you go to find materials, renew, etc., as well as fifth edition. So we hopefully this little chart will be self-explanatory and make sense to you. The biggest thing you have to understand is um, though CSCP is the uh, owner of the Cambridge Latin course, they have licensed it you know, to be published by Cambridge University Press and in the fifth edition to have the fifth edition um, digital materials housed on the Cambridge University Press Elevate platform. Um, the fourth edition, they have agreed to do the same, but because it has not been part of the licensing that has come up now, it is still being paid for. You still buy it through CSCP directly. And you have to go on their website, but they're very helpful and, and there's a strong team over there who will give you great support. On the right side, one of the things that is changing is October 1st, there will be a shift of 2018. There will be a shift in who are the reps. There are two, there will be four. Um, and, uh, you know, if you ever have a problem getting a hold of a rep or you're having a problem with feeling like you're getting the right response from world languages, please j just call write us because we can probably jump in there we might know something different than what you know or we may just be able to facilitate in some way all right are we ready we are ready so it's so funny we've been doing elevate so long that it never occurred to us until someone recently asked us well where's the website and we thought oh maybe we should tell you so we um would like you to know that that is the login and when you get there, I'm going to have to jump out of this. You will get to this screen. So the first thing you're going to need is a code. And there's many different ways you can get a code. First of all, if you've had nothing to do with the series or you, your school has done nothing or you've done nothing, the first thing you can do is you can click here to trial the series for 30 days. Um, 
But we're assuming that that is not the most common situation. And we're assuming that it's none of these people that are on here. So, But if you are, I mean, that one's pretty self-explanatory. You click, you fill out the form, they facilitate you having a, a code that will give you part of Elevate. You get the student part of Elevate, not the teacher part. Okay, so moving on. Donna, you want to do this or? Uh, well, you're going to go to the two situations where the codes are. You're going to go backwards. Well, first, we're going to talk about the fact that if your school is providing the code, it means that you're, it was bought by a school district, a board okay. of ed, a headmaster, your department chair, somehow or other it came out of your school's funds. And therefore, whoever has bought it for you, and whether it's the purchase order generator in the business office is going to be part of the process of getting your codes. And oftentimes, at least this past fall, um, that would be a year ago, the um, w people couldn't find their codes because the codes were given to an administrator or a secretary. They didn't know what they had, and so they didn't get disseminated. So hopefully this fall, it was much easier and you got um, control of your codes. The codes are these 16 digit num uh, letters that have to be exact. And they, you should get one student code for each student. Plus a teacher code for you, which would be at the bottom and it would be a right. Uh, there would be another either another tab or at the bottom of the whole list, depending on the size. And these are early um, codes that we got last year. They're now 12 month codes. They're not 15 month in case you're saying, how come mine's 12 and yours is 15? It's because these are a year old. That's why I felt comfortable using them. These have all been assigned to somebody. Um, we just wanted to give you a, a quick snapshot of what it is that you can expect to be looking at. It does come as an Excel spreadsheet with all of those different letters. The only difference is you wouldn't have anything on the right hand side where we have all of the names pasted in. That would be for you to do once once you get your codes, you might want to pre assign those codes to the students in your class. And possibly depending on your school's policy, you can also paste in a um, uh, the rest of the information, their, their, their email and their password, if you're going to give it to them. And we'll get to that more specifically in a few minutes. And some of you may have bought your own co uh, codes. Therefore, they would come to you. And then that's when you need to follow the quick start guide that is that comes with those codes that's emailed to you or to the purchaser. And if you bought it yourself or you're wondering, well, how do I do that? That would be world languages online at cambridge.org. Um, OK, and we'll talk a little more about that, too. There's a slight problem if you are not a teacher that can prove they're a teacher. In other words, you're not in a school of some structure. We've had some issues with that. We can hopefully help you get it, but we may not be able to. So just know that buying your own because and you work in a school is not a problem. It's if you're a homeschooler, may be a problem. So um, when you do get your codes, coming with it will be two um, PDFs or PowerPoints, and one is for the um, students and one is for the teacher. So you're going to start with the teacher one. And we're actually going to go through all this, but just so you think, oh my gosh, I can't write all this down, or I just don't learn that fast, or I'm tired. Here it is. Everything we're going to say is going to be right here. Um, we just find that people appreciate seeing it explained, and we can also talk about things we know. Okay, so there's this teacher one, which is a little more complicated, not complicated, more lengthy and has some interesting information. And then the student one, which is one of the ways you can set it up is just hand this to students. If you have smart students and feel they can handle it on their own. We'll talk about that too in a couple of minutes. All right. Anything else anybody wants to say about quick starts? No. Okay. No. So you will get to this page and you will need a username and a password. And the way you go about it is if you've never been on the site before, you will um, have to enter a code to get on. Okay. Um, if you have not 
gotten if you just bought like one code and they sell you a student code you will go on you, you won't be able to get the teacher materials but we're assuming right now that all these people are people who have gotten their codes and maybe they haven't gone on yet and this is how you do it so you click on i am a teacher no seriously you click on i am a teacher <laughs> i don't know why it's slow today and the first thing it asks you for is a book code which has become a little confusing for people the code that's the teacher code is the code they expect you to put in there. The rest of this is self-generated. You decide your username, your first name, your last name. Um, this is the email you would use if you need to reset your password because you don't remember it. Um, and of course, then you have to write a password. And then they want to know a bit about who you are and where you work. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anything too unusual there. And once you've registered, you should be able to log in right here. With the same username and password that you just created. Yeah. So the first thing we need to tell you is all these individual books are part of a past generation of this thing. They just ignore them. They do not exist. And the second thing we need to tell you is you will have um, assuming you've gotten a teacher's code, you will have one of these for the fifth edition and one of these. If you've bought the fourth edition, you will only have this. Obviously, because since we talk to people using both, we have both. So tonight we're going to pretty much focus on the fifth edition because um, the fourth edition has much of what the fifth edition has, but not everything. They have their other solutions. We do have a question. All of my students purchase their own books, so I'm assuming that my department does not have codes for me. Mm. If I purchase my own access as a teacher, does it come with a certain amount of codes for students, or is that an additional purchase? Um, well, it, if you purchase your own access as a teacher, you get just one code for you. Um, unless you're buying codes for all of your students. But yes, you're correct. If your students purchase their own books, um, they don't have the if, if they purchase their own books from a third party source, they do not have the ability to purchase Elevate. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's something that you would have to pursue with the rep and then, you know, you would probably have to collect the money and I mean, you could work around it, but no, there's no easy way because the whole point of controlling the codes were attached to the books and generated by Cambridge. So by going through a third party, that piece gets lost, you know. Um, I don't think there's anything else we can say about that, can we? No. They, okay. they would only get the, the teacher code if they purchased a teacher, uh, a, a book, sorry, as a teacher. Um, Patricia asked if we um, can, up, can you upload um, teacher worksheets. The answer is there's no place to store anything like that. But I know, Patricia, you are working with homeschoolers. So you could very easily, I, I believe you can send something in a message. I'm not sure about that. I'd have to look, but the answer is it's not designed for that. It's designed for you to come and use a series of things that are provided by Cambridge. Um, you could always set up a Google account right alongside it and just put the two, to, you know, use the two side by side. Uh, so once you're on here, you as a teacher, again, again, if you have the teacher code, you have access to all this and you can go anywhere you want. Um, your students, if they come on as a students, don't have access to their, um, they, they need to be put into a group if you want to have access to their account so you can change their password if there's a problem or even reassign a, um, some part of it to someone else. Like say you use Latin one. So, you, the good thing to do would be to set up a um, a, a, a book, um, a group for them. And to do that, they have to add their, their book code here. Now, wait a minute. We, no, 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 wait a minute. If they come on as a student, they don't need to add a book code. They just need to get the group code, right? 
yeah. they need the group code yeah. when you, and you de you develop the group code. So that's how you do that. So right. Um, we're going to set that up later. And I know we just had another question that I didn't see. It's something about an ISBN number. Um, I can't see it. Oh, okay. So it came through in my world. Um, I'll have to look in a minute. Um, I'm sorry, the add the books is if like say some of you are at a point where it's expiring and you get another code, you would just click here. Or for some of you who might have at some point just bought a student and resources and get a teacher code sent to you, you click on add a book and you add it there. You have to remember Elevate was designed for everything that Cambridge University Press sells, so their biology, their chemistry, other stuff. So they're thinking you're going to be adding a whole bunch of books. Um, not necessarily just one code. Yeah. All right. And Jenny, click on the help button so that they can see the various topics there that can answer questions. And, and this is a good one, even if you've been around a while, because it goes through a lot of what we were just talking about. And again, if you don't understand something, you can um, spend some time here. And then there's this. Um, the only this is their actual homepage for Elevate um, on their website, and they have um, lots of help and information. Now, some of it goes beyond the scope of the Latin course. You know, you know, if it's a biology class and they have some kind of lab type thing, well, we don't have that. You know, see, some you know it might be there's some other things that they can do, but this would just give you if you really did need more help. There's some kind of extra help here too. And we're the other thing you can always check with us and there's a good chance if they don't tell you, we might know the answer. Okay, so this is that thing where and then this confuses people because you have to get to the bottom of the screen. To close this. You have to move the. Yeah, dial. Yeah, you have to do that. It's not blue and, you have to move the blue and white. I know, but it's not letting me. See? Oh, it's not letting you? Okay. This is what I'm saying. All right, hold on. I just, oh, really? You're going to be like that? I don't think so. Huh. Or you can make your screen smaller so you can get to the end button. Oh, there, there the X is in the top right hand corner. Right, but it wouldn't, when I had it this big, you couldn't see it. Yes, I know. Yeah, so that's the deal. You got the two. Okay, so you know what? See, that's good for you to know because we did have somebody write us and say, how do you close the thing? And it's probably like my screen, it was too big. So you can, if you can't find the X or the N, just, um, you know, on the Mac, you hit command and the negative sign, and the um, minus or, yeah, minus sign. And on the PC, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what it is, but I'm sure you would know just to make your screen smaller. Okay. I tend to keep it a little big so you all can see well. All right. So we're going to go to the student resources first. And in my, in the various trainings that I've done with teachers um, in the past summer, a lot of them were using a lot of teachers were using the teacher code and loving it using the teacher resources, but they really hadn't explored the student resources or hadn't put their students on elevate. Um, and so here are all the things that are there for the students and they're wonderful and they're not there for teachers. They're there for kids. So Mary Richards said there's a separate ISBN for buying one book plus a, uh, a book code for students. Buying a book plus a code for students. So my school purchased a code for me. It came with both a teacher code and a student code. So yeah, that's what we said so that, that we can access the both the textbook and the components that students sees. Okay. Yeah, I thought she said something else. Right. That yes, that's exactly right. You you get one of each as a teacher. The problem with the other question was that teacher wanted to know how she gets her student codes at all if they buy their own books. Okay, so we thought instead of starting at the top, we will come back to the top. We just wanted to show you, um, first off, a couple of things. Uh, every first of all, I went from home to here. The home is obviously what's going to take you back and forth. Um, you have a contents for the four um, stages. Units. What's that, Donna? Units. I'm sorry, units. You think I know that after 32 years. Um, and you can, you know, click down and find stage five. You can also find a stage here. There's other things we'll get into at some other point. Okay, so I'm going to go to stage five. I'll go to stage five that way. 
close that out so we have a little more room. And we just want to show you that there's um, at the top there's some content and we're going to talk more about the web book. There are some explore the stories, a whole bunch of different kinds of things to do that are activities and practicing the language. There is a wonderful interactive dictionary and if you're in the fifth edition, you will have all these different videos. We find sometimes people don't know the videos are down there. So we just want to show you what the overview is and now we'll go back and talk about the components. Each of the stages starts out with just a, a brief sentence or two about the stage itself. And then, as you can see right under the thumbnail sketch, it says CSCP website. Those are those of you that are familiar with fourth edition and the old website. Those cultural links were really outstanding and they've really been cleaned up and sorted through and put together by topic which makes it really easy for both you and your students to find pretty much whatever you're looking for. The list is extensive and more things on here than you could possibly use. So as you can see, it's in stage five, it's divided up into these different categories. And notice at the bottom of this one, the comedy tragedy, there's a more links and this takes you to another part of the website where it looks like it's going to be um, yeah, stage, stage three, three yeah. and mine is, and it gives you more. Uh, and they've, what I like is they've all been vetted by educators. You know, you're not telling the kids to type something into Google. Because as we well know, you can end up with something you do not want them to have. So this is great. And what's also nice about these, and, and we've talked about this sometimes before, is, you know, some of these are just a photo, like the one I clicked on, the one model you know or like this is a, this is a reconstruction this is a movie reconstruction you could say you know every these two kids look at this one and everybody get every two kids gets one and you discuss as a group you know in one or two minutes what you see on that particular thing and then you share your insights with the class and it gets everybody looking at things instead of just reading about and here's another one you could always you know put this on the board and then show them the actual inscription and talk about, you know, can you read it? What does it say? You know, how hard is it to read? Whatever, you know, um, it's a great way to very quickly pull them into an activity. You could also take a couple of those different topics and make that a homework assignment and ask mm -hmm. students to to take um, to take a to just quickly go through the topics and decide which one find something that they particularly liked that they could share with the class or put them together in groups lots of different ways you can use these and here's the brilliant part they can't copy it from anyone there's nothing to copy. If you've said to six kids, you know, or that, you know, if you divided your class into six or seven groups and there's a certain letter and they know that they have that, of course they're going to talk to the people in their group, but that's what you want. Did you watch the movie Reconstruction? Yes. Okay. So, you know, and Donna says, I really liked it. And Martha says, well, I thought it was kind of dumb, but, you know, when they come into class, I'm going to say, well, what was dumb about it? What did you like about it? And, you know, it becomes a discussion that they've had beforehand so there's nothing for them to hand in that has been cheated or copied from somewhere i think it's a lot of fun for them actually they actually enjoy it and they get they get a little outraged at how like you know crazy some of the things are which is good and as everybody knows this is one of the one of the aims of the cambridge latin course it's not only to uh, get students to read authentic literature as quickly and as efficiently as possible, but it's to teach them about Roman culture. So you will notice that in every single one of these stages, the cultural information is first. Uh, in, in nearly every single stage, that culture is integrated into the storyline. And by having the students do some research and look up some of these different cultural topics. It just gets them excited and enthused about reading the stories in that particular stage. 
So there's two versions of the web book. One is an offline that theoretically, if you know your school is turning off its website, um, its internet for some reason, you can click on it and you have a functioning copy of the book for, we're not sure how long, but a number of hours, it seems. At least one, but we think it's longer than that. We've just never tried it that long. I've never had it go off either. Yeah, right. So oh. here's the deal. I actually opened it twice. Notice everything opens in a new tab. What's nice about that is if you really wanted to, you could pre-tab a few things at the beginning of a class so you're not necessarily clicking. Or you might want to be jumping back and forth from a, um, an activity to the web book, and this way you're not having to wait for a page to load. They're there. So this is really a, a, a version of a, a, just a glorified set of pictures, a PDF. You know, all 12 stages are here, as well as the language information uh, section that's in the back of the book. And if you click on any stage, you get the page number. So if you happen to know you need to be on a certain page, you, it's right there. So you don't have to guess. Um, and it's just basically the book. And uh, I know Donna has said many times that sometimes it's really good to get everybody to focus, right? Um, I like projecting them because they're not looking down. They're not looking at someplace else. They're looking at the, the board, the screen, whatever you want to call it. And I can point to it. I can mark on it. We can do all those kinds of things at the same time. And there's nothing, it, you, there's no interactivity. You can't click on anything. It's not that kind of a thing. It is simply exactly the book. A yeah. book. And the other thing is I had very diverse classes. I mean, my learners went from people who, you know, had IEPs up the wazoo and everything else to people. This was their third or fourth language in high school. Um, so one of the things I found was that you had also you had different types of learners. And I, I, I had to use the DVDs back in the day, but I would pop up the, the Explorer. But now I would pop up this and say, you know, yeah, you're going to page 61. I might have written page 61 on the board, but you know what? Here's a picture of 60 and 61. If you're having trouble remembering the number, aim for it. You know, I mean, it's just another way for the kinesthetic learner, the visual learner. You're just cutting out a whole bunch of what page is that, or what did you say, or where is it? What does it look board? like? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So that's pretty much that part. And as we said, you can navigate if you wanted to go to the end of the, the, the language information pamphlet. You have to um, scroll down, and there it is. And now we come to the thing that most of us were most excited about on the old website, the uh, one that was first I'm generated. Excited about it on the new website too. <laughs> well, right, but I mean, it's but it's yeah, it's going to be even more exciting. That was what I was about to say. But yeah, the um, the stories, each one of them is up here, and every story has a listen button. Um, people have said well it doesn't work on mine you have to click the sentence to start it so and you click off of it on the same sentence or you click off listen one of the two right and it's a great way to get them to do choral reading that takes away that affective filter or you can have them repeat it one sentence at a time however you want to do it um, it's nice to have another voice in the room besides yours that speaks Latin. So that's great. The next button over is the read button. Hold on. Sorry. One. Real quickly, uh, the other thing you can do with the listen button is make it a second read. Go home and listen to this. Listen to it and let your parents listen with you. Or it could be a pre read. You don't expect them to figure out what it says. Or maybe you do, maybe they won't. But just go home and listen to this tonight. And one of the things I like to do is have students actually read along with the recording so that it, it helps them with with their phrasing, those sentence patterns that are so important in Cambridge, and it helps them tremendously with their own pronunciation. So Donna, back to your read statement. Okay. The read is the story explorer. You may have heard that term. Um, the Story Explorer lets the students click on every single word 
and it gives them at the bottom or in a pop up um, the meaning of that word. Eventually, it gives them grammatical information, but it never gives them more than they have been currently exposed to. So they know accusative, they know third singular and plural. So that it will tell them those things. But they don't know adjectives as, a, as a, the form of adjectives, so it didn't do anything there. Um, they are thrilled that they can click on every word, um, but if you don't want them to do that, I think there are a couple things you can do. Jenny has one. Um, I think, you know, by the time I get them in, um, especially Latin 2, I want them to stop using the every cl click every word. I'll ask them to do things and only click five words. Right. Can I do I go home with them and check? No. Nope. But I'm trusting them and they're trusting me that if they're going to learn Latin, they're they're going to have to do some things for themselves. So yeah, and I think too, I, I mean, back in the day when I had a computer lab and we would go in there like in stage 19, when you have both Pampa and Navasakra, and then you're going to have Wanatio, that's, there's a lot of reading going on there. So I would, you know, sometimes in class I'd give them, split the groups up, but other times I wanted them to read both stories. So I'd say, you know what, you have this period to read the stories. So they would realize quickly that you, you, you would just slow yourself down so tremendously if you clicked on every word, but that wasn't the first time we'd done something where they'd been in there under a bit of a time constraint, you know, or as Donna said, with, you can only click on so many words. Um, I found the kid who clicked on every word just eventually came to realize it wasn't really all that wonderful, That's but now they've built into, I'm sorry, Martha. No, it's the same as looking at a word in a dictionary. If yeah. you look up every word, yeah, it's going to take forever. So, you know, you can have them send you a picture of this page or if they're, you know, you could also say, well, you know, again, the point is to know the words. So here's the words and they've got to take a quiz. And I don't know, I think that might motivate me not to take as many, um, uh, click as many words. Now, the bad thing about the quiz, or not the bad thing, it, but the fact is the quiz doesn't go anywhere. But, um, you know, some of it comes down to the culture you create in your classroom about this kind of thing. And if you think about it, having students uh, with a physical textbook where they're looking up words in the back of the dictionary, it's that const that back and forth between the story and the back of the book is one of the things that th that is a disconnect for many kids because that physical going back and forth, they're not comprehending what they're reading. Whereas when they can click on the word right in front of them, it actually speeds up their reading and allows them to comprehend more. You know, one of the criticisms we've heard recently, which is a little hard for us to get our heads around, is there's too much vocabulary in the Cambridge Latin course. Um, I taught for, for almost three decades and um, I think what people don't realize is it was designed with the idea that not every word needed to be held on to deeply and passionately in your heart and brain. That many words were there just to tell the story. And in essence, they became words you held on to by their frequency. You know, so just because a word is in here, it's fine that and I'm just going to pick on any words. Obviously, actors, they could figure out anyway. You know, there's some words that, okay. They maybe you'll see it in the Aeneid or maybe they'll see it in someone else, but it's not a sin against life if you don't necessarily have them memorize that word or they don't remember that word. Um, sometimes we, I think, as teachers get that fear that they're not going to be able to go on, but we need to know what words are important. So if, you know, they're flipping along and they don't, you know, even, almost any word, you don't want to spend too much time on it. You want them to keep the comprehension going, you know. And if they're looking at sentence patterns and they're getting a sense of what's happening, they're likely to um, be like, okay, okay, that word makes sense there. Not always, but likely. Uh, back to this think button. <clears throat> In the physical book, um, at least one story a stage has comprehension questions. And on Elevate, two stories per stage basically have comprehension questions. So that means that 
three stories out of a stage out of five have comprehension questions. These particular comprehension questions are so unique to me um, because they're so varied. They're multiple choice, they're fill in the blank, they're comprehension, they're grammar, they're everything that is possible to be in a question. And there's so much you can do with them. Um, you, you can do anything you want. You can flip your classroom. You can assign the reading and ha come the next day and ask these questions. Um, they're really, really great tools to use. So um, it's, I think, a genius way to get through a story, to get through a reading of a story. And so. again, you know, you, you, you do the story in class, you talk about it a little bit, you send them home. You know, they don't have to, they just tell them to go through the questions. Um, you can just pick out five and use it as a uh, do now or check with it or do another activity that incorporates the same stuff in it and be see if you know, if they own it. And if they don't own it, hmm, did you really do it? You know, um, and sometimes you disagree. There was one question just now that I picked the answer I thought was right and I disagreed with them. That's OK. You know, you can just still have the um, they can you can talk about why you might even disagree with what their answer is. You know, I think that's part of a teacher's role is to model with the students what learning's about. So, yeah, there's been times I thought, hmm, is that really the right answer? And I'll tell them why I think it isn't. Yeah. And then if you, you want to start over for the next class, you just hit clear. So the derive button is simply that there's the, any word that has derivatives in English and French and Spanish are down here. Um, there's nothing more to it than that. Um, it's just to make the point that they do exist. Um, they used to be in the teacher's manual. Um, there's not a lot to say about them. So moving on, we assume most everybody has seen our test of vocabulary, but in case you haven't, uh, it's a very favorite thing of ours. You can start with anything from 10 words all the way up to 500. You can uh, set a time limit from one minute, no, no limit to five minutes. Um, this is one of the ways that I press them a little bit, unless I know they have an uh, issue with stress, then I don't. Um, I've never used the seconds per word, but I suppose always Latin to English in my mind, because I want them to recognize the word and know what it means. First time through, it is always on the checklist words, which is the list at the end of the chapter. Um, I notice it says where in and stage five. Um, so if you wanted them to know the words, I'm sorry, I'm getting some things. Oh, stage five's words are here. Otherwise you start the thing and you just click on it. And if you get it wrong, you have to click on the right one to get it right. I'm just gonna go through this real quickly. Very stressful to do this with people watching you. <laughs> you know, the students absolutely love doing this. It's just a really good way for them to review not only the vocabulary in the stage that you're working on, but Jenny will show you, you can also do up to stage five. So this is where that, con this is where that spiraling, that review comes in. It makes it really easy for kids to constantly go back and review every word that they've they've had. You can do checklist words, or if you you can do all new words up to stage five and give them a hundred words. It's a way to expand their vocabulary, because you know if they get one wrong, a lot of times they want to do it again, um, or you get a few wrong. Um, so that's really kind of cool. I will tell you that the type in I know there's teachers who want to make sure they can they know it exactly, but if like if you don't think the word has a hyphen and the person that typed it in originally thinks it has a hyphen it's going to be wrong and it just that can be very frustrating to a student so just be, be i would say keep in your head what is your goal your goal is reading reading for comprehension so you would want them to recognize words know them intuitively have a sense of them and then you're going to do other things to make them own the words but the con the actual meaning the one of the levels is going to be do you, do you know what this word when you look at it it means so. and this is a great place I, I, you didn't mention it yes jenny for differentiation true for that kid who has struggles with vocab so you give them a longer time with 
fewer, fewer words, the kid that bit buzzes through them, up the ante. Yep. And they're all working. I've even done it where we were in before um, a, like a midterm and I would, you know, say we're on stage 11, usually that's where we'd fall and I'd put it in the hundreds. Um, and I'd have kids at different levels. But if I had some kid who was still managing to sit there scratching their head, let's say I'd done stage 10, I might say, why don't you do stage 12? Um, the checklist words or 11 in the checklist words. Yeah, you're going to get some wrong, but most of them will find they know some too. So, you know, it's a great way to push the envelope. It's also a fabulous way to show parents at back to school night because, you know, they just have to lean over their kids. I would send home a picture of this and on this handout I would give and I'd say, all you have to do is watch your kids set it up. And I would say, this is what I recommend. Um, and then the other thing is, it's great if a parent's frustrated and you say, well, let Johnny or Janie come after school and um, I stick them in front of this. And first of all, I could tell if they can't set it up, they've never been here. Yeah. So. This next group, uh, the language activities, we uh, we call these the, the drag and drop exercises. If you're familiar with the fourth edition and the e-learning DVD, uh, these were the kinds of exercises that are on the e-learning DVD that have been migrated over to the fifth edition. And these are just uh, quick, quick little review exercises. The kids love doing these. These are great as a do now when kids first come into class. You could make a game out of it. Uh, one half of the room versus the other half. If each of your students has his own um, account, uh, this is another way that students can practice all of the different language topics on their own. And th they're fun. And there's there are lots of them, and the kids just love doing these. I don't remember who it was, but at one of the summer workshops we did, someone, um, let me see, then there's another question. But someone would say, go home and practice these three. They expected them to practice it to the point where they knew that those words were singular or plural. And then they handed them out a set of cards with the same words on it. But maybe like instead of there being eight words, there would be 16 or 20 words and say, OK, now sort them out. So it, the idea was to do it so much that your brain started to say, OK, I know that. I notice a lot of them are forms. And then there's one that's meanings. Well, meanings in that you have to know what it's about, you know, so and I don't know if you noticed I was getting one wrong every so often and. Um, well, before I get the one wrong, I'd like to point out that after a while, some kids will notice, well, these all have a T. That's a good thing. But before I can go on, I have to move these to the right side. It won't let you go on if you haven't fixed your mistake and then it does the same thing over and over again. So one of the questions that we had earlier was how grammar focused are the student exercises? Um, well, as you can see from these exercises, um, I mean, that's about as grammar focused as they are because this is a reading comprehension course. But are there paradigms? Uh, yes, in the back of the book, uh, Jenny, I think you were just about to show that. Yeah, so all the paradigms are there. There are additional sentences that students can practice reviewing a particular case or a particular verb tense. Notice that in book one, they have only the three cases because they haven't met the others yet. So it's it's only the paradigm only exists for how much they've learned. And it's how much they've learned through the reading as opposed to explicit grammar. And, and if on the other hand, you're asking because you don't want a lot of grammar. I mean, I just see these as supportive. I don't see these as, I mean, I don't know. My kids always enjoyed them. And, you know, we would find somewhere along the line, we'd have something I said, someone would get the AE a singular and we'd talk about it. And so we'd always say, remember the, you know, the chart or I don't know. I just never saw it as something that really affected us that much. It just helped them to consolidate an idea. And that's all I ever wanted to do was consolidate and move forward, you know, each thing, because um, that's part of the whole spiraling idea. 
The last two things, you might notice this note here that I put, practice and language exercises are digital versions of exercises in the actual textbook. So the only thing you need to know is if you're assigning these in class or you're assigning these for homework, well, first of all, the answers are out there somewhere. I would say do these in class, the actual sentences. And if they're doing them on the, their whatever's in class, the problem is, is that they get the answer right and they don't feel like typing in a sentence and they type that in, they will get the correct sentence. So in my humble opinion, I would do these in class and I'd frankly do them from the book. And I might do them orally with them. I might have them pick out the Latin and then let's go through and make sure everybody has the same Latin and then ask them, is there any, you know, pick a sentence and say, maybe I'd say. You know, which sentence says this, or we would translate them. There is a place for translation. It's just not high on the food chain like it was back in the day. So not our, that's not our easy, that's not one that we tend to spend all that much time on. All right, so just real quickly for those of you who um, didn't know this, there is a dictionary. Um, one of the things I like about the dictionary is that it has a, um, a, a, a pronunciation. So if you really don't know how to say this word, Aegyptios. There's no argument. It's Aegyptios. Not the, and this one, my kids would always say, um, you know, Agricola. Agricola. Yeah. yeah. No, I'd say Ricola. Agricola. And I'd say, come on, Ricola, Agricola. But yes, you know, so that would, you know, clear up some of those things. Ampeteatro. You know, and help them with things that have a lot of syllables. The other thing is, if you are um, passionate about uh, charts and for some reason absolutely need to have one for, there it is. So if a kid's confused or you want them to look it up or I don't know, it's there. I'm not sure why, but it's there. Why? All right, so we're at the videos. There are two kinds of videos. Um, this one, actually three. This one introduces the stage. The ones that tend to have a Latin word in them um, have something to do with the readings. They either are just an introduction or some subtitles, which we'll show you in a moment. And then there's ones where the titles are in English, and that pretty much hints that it's a documentary. And the beautiful part about those documentaries. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, we'll come back to this. Yeah. Now you're going to make someone special. Papaya. Oh, she okay. lives a few doors away with old Lucrio. I wonder if he'll toddle along to see the show. Oh, he's so lazy. So there's good old. Romeo. The wonderful thing about these introductions, not only the introduction to the stage itself, but the stories themselves have a little intro and they're they're generally about a minute and just a, enough time to really pique the student's interest. So, subtitles or no subtitles, lady? With, with subtitles. Yes. Uh, we're out of, we have 11 minutes left. We may go over. Oh, OK. Yeah. I think I'll just play a bit of this. Ego amico meum expecto. Ubi est amicus. Eh, Lucrio est in villa. Lucrio, agricolae urbem entrant. Agricola adds Oh, oh. Agricola? Lucrio? Lucrio? Query per viam current. Quit to camas. For fire. Go to camorum factis. Lucrio? Pompeiani clamorum factis. So that gives you an idea of that one. These story dramatizations and cultural videos are on, only available for units one and two, and there are about 24 or 25 of the story dramatizations. The kids absolutely love them. Many of them are quite cheesy, but they're just, the kids they're, just love them. They're a good cheesy. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So as you can see, this particular set of videos, there's five of them, um, and they're different lengths. Um, I'm not going to play them other than to show you this one's six minutes. Um, when news of a performance was advertised in the city, the Pompeians. Okay, thank you. 
So there might be six minutes, they might be shorter, some are a um, reenactment of something that they filmed. Um, they're nice. These are great for flipping. Go, go home and watch this and come up with three questions that you think your, your classmates should be able to answer or have them write them down and then somebody else has to answer them. You know, um, they're great. And they're great extensions to the cultural essay that's in the book. They're not a repeat, but they're more. Now, remember that those story dramatizations and cultural videos only happen for units one and two. There's nothing for three and four. Right. And on Elevate, they're only in the fifth edition. You could have to get, if you're in the fourth edition, the videos and so forth are still on the DVD. So. All right, we're going to move uh, to the teacher resources, which are comprised of, of three things. It, uh, you have the teacher's manual and then a brand new set of tests with, with an answer key. And then you have, they're called teacher study sheets, but they're really student worksheets that are divided into categories. They're divided into language worksheets, culture worksheets, and then story-based worksheets. They call it civilization, but we know they mean culture. And every single one of them has a, an answer key behind it. And don't be tricked if you have something that says, uh, the teacher will read these sentences aloud. They are always on the answer sheet and they might be on a second page, but they are there. And the tests, oops, sorry, I apologize. The test, if you, um, you'll start with a story, which we ask that you read aloud to the students. We suggest you don't give them the test or have them cover the test until after they've heard the story read out loud. Um, it's just part of getting them to focus on a, a, a contextual setting and a reading setting. Then you're going to give them the test and I'm going to give you the mark scheme because, which is the answer, the answer key, because we're going to cut to the pick, um, cover two things at once here. So you can see the points are over here. Some are just a one word, some are pick a your poison type thing. Um, some may even have one more than one possible answer. And the woman who has written these, she's given us what she thinks are the other possible answers. You could even have another one. It's your test, you know. Um, and then this one is nice because part of it is a pick the answer and this, the rest of it is, so why did you choose what you chose? So that's kind of cool. This is not to study or um, grade us. Um, I'm sorry, assess all their vocabulary. It's just to hit a few of the words. So there's seven or eight of those. The same with the language. It's not to like drill home all the language. It's just to see, given the circumstance, um, you know, what if you knew who where Grumio was working, where would you put him? You know, where should he be, based on the story? And then the other big part of the. The, the test is the same as the um, reading is the culture. And it goes back to what Martha said earlier. That's what the course is about, learning about the culture of our people while reading about them in their own language. So you'll notice that there's a number of questions. There's always some kind of um, artifact or um, layout or something that uh, you know, makes them focus on some information. Again, multiple choice, multiple possible answers. And then um, it says, in what ways would the design and layout of Caecilius's house be different from yours or from a modern house? So here's the, um, what she has suggested is how you grade that, the rubric, and then here are the answers. So you can, you know, pick and choose what you want, how many you're going to hold them to, but it's pretty nice. And the test altogether comes up to 50 points. Right. They, um, they pretty, are pretty comprehensive. And remember that you are not handing, letting the students keep these tests. You are keeping them um, for yourself and under lock and key. So, because it is the only thing we have and we know that unit four tests all got out there. So we can try to keep the fifth test um, as well guarded as we possibly can. Okay, so we one of the things is if you want to know um, your if you want to have some control of your students' groups, you need to set up a group. Um, as you can see, I have a group set up here, and I'll explain how to. And I have three students in them. Okay, if I click on Lucia, Lucia 
I have her first name and her last name, and I can reset her password. So, and I can also edit it to a degree. So again, you know, there's some things you can change. If you have someone leave three weeks into the semester and you want to assign it to another kid, you really can. You know, so you go ahead and do that. Um, but how do you set up a group? Oh, and the other thing is you can, um, it shows you all of your uh, students, okay? And there's some things you can do with them over here. You can, uh, again, we just were there. You can also um, see what group they're assigned to, okay? So, the way you do a group, you see how here it says no groups here and here it says uh, period three. So if I come here, um, one of the things I can do is create a group. And what you'll see here is type the name of your group below. This is the group name students will see. You can do um, period one, you can do Latin one, you could do, if you decide that you want to do something funny and clever, you could do, you know, the Dumnorix group and the Bolimicus group. I don't care. We don't care. So maybe if you're homeschooling, you might want to put emperors in to help them if you have three different groups of kids. But you just need to know the name of your group. Okay, so um, Latin, I've done most of these, so I'm going to make a Latin five. Oh, that wasn't where it went, though. Sorry about that. Latin five. Okay. You make up the code. This part has to be in it, but the, and it has to be at least six characters, but no more than nine. Okay. So you could just do if that's what you want or what? six. 753 AD. Okay. Right. I need one more. Okay. Yeah. So AD, something like that. All right. Whatever it is, you're going to give your students this. So you create a group. Access code. Oh, I'm not allowed to have an exam. All right, so I'll one at the end of it. Fine, be that way. Okay, so now I have that group. I give the students this. They enter the code, and they become a member of this particular group. See, um, they've gotten in. So they had a book code, and now they're going to enter this group code. And it's kind of handy to have a group code. You can message your students uh, by their group code, by the group they're in. Um, you can give them an assignment. So the, the group code, it can be very handy. And I would say that there's a way to broadcast the message or some, this happens to be a fake one, but I was practicing and you know, I acted as if the kid was out of school and I said, hey, finish this. And then the kid wrote me back and said, I completed it. Um, and if there's a message, you have like one of those number ones, like you will on a phone type thing. Um, many of you have systems in your school for communication, so you may not find it necessary for this. And we recognize that. We just want you to know it exists and you can send something to a particular group. Um, more importantly, or as important is you can change their passwords. And so if you are using one of your, using your particular school's messaging system, that would be the one thing that you would want to do though, is, is create a group just so that you can track all of their passwords. So we're at the point where you have a bunch of students. There's a whole bunch of ways you can get them online. One way is you can give them that um, quick guide, and if they're the kind of kids, you know, as one of my friends had, she said, I sent them home on Friday and told them to do it by Monday. And all but one of her students came in with it done. Um, they're going to click, or you can have them, if you have everybody has their own device, you could click, have them click on them, and you walk around and make sure they enter the code that you've given them and all this information. And again, it has to be a real email, so nobody can be a wise guy if they want to be able to reset their like if they want to say forgot your own password as with every other website they have to be able to receive an email to reset it so if they're home and it's the summer and they can't get into get to you or whatever they can still set it up um the other thing and i know donna has done this a couple of times is you know you have one kid come to your room to the front of the room and do their um do it on your computer. So you can, you know, especially if younger students, you can look over the shoulder and make sure they're doing it right. Um, but 
the other thing you can do, which means I have to go back in here now as a teacher, um, and we don't know. It's, it's something that some people seem to think is a great idea and other people think, are you kidding me? Um, under manage users, one of the things you can do is, oh, you know what? I forgot to open this up. You can download a template, which is going to look like this. Really, Excel, you're going to be like that? So anyway, you're going to fill out the form, and while you're fit, once you filled out the form, you're going to import it. So, uh, you know, and um, you might be able to, you know, you can take the codes from the code part and plop them here if you want. Um, you may be able to um, cut and paste some of this from some other spreadsheet you have. Class roster or whatever. Yeah, and you and it's up to you can have them make their own usernames or you can say, you know what, your username is in my case vblasi or you can say it's your Latin name, you know, and your password that I'm going to set up with you is this and then you can change it. User type their students and you may know their email, you may not. Okay. You you these last three just, you know, they're there but you notice they're not bolded, you do not have to do them. So don't worry about that. If this LFB ID means their book code. Right. Yeah, their book code, right. So that, and then once you have that, you can import it um, and uh, they're set up. It depends on who you are. Like if you want to, you know, take the time in class or if you want to take the time to type all that or cut and paste it, depends on how technologically savvy you are. Um, the good thing is if your kids come back for two and three years, that. Um, while they'll need a new code each year because it'll run out, um, you can kind of move them around or, and they're, they're still in the system. Okay. Do we have any last questions from anyone before we, before we sign off this evening? I haven't seen any more. No, I haven't either. Well, Archie, I'm Is there anything them. that we've said that just was very... Hello, I have a whole bunch of things here. Oh. oh, okay. Okay, so you got the one about the paradigms. Right. Okay, wait, what else do we have? Oh, some people said they had trouble. They changed to Chrome. Never mind, there's nothing new. I thought it was. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was reading the wrong way. Um, the only other thing I would say is if you get to the point where you're um, in the program a while and you want to play around with one thing that we haven't talked about and it's on the quick start guide you might have noticed my addition um sometimes things have like a a bookmark next to it because if you have four classes using it four different ways you can put a bookmark that will help you get back to you know where you have something uh bookmarked for that day so you don't have to keep running through different places from period to period or let you know how far you got in one class. Right, exactly. And then uh, the other thing is you can create a note, which is basically what you're doing is you're going to click on this little arrow if you do it right, which I never do. Um, okay, really, Ginny? It's going to be one, a right click. I'm sorry, I don't have no brain tonight. Um, so here's you can make a note, you can highlight it. That one I never quite understand why. You can web link to something outside the website. I like to like a YouTube video, you can hyperlink to another part of this thing. If say you're in Latin three and you think, oh, this thing in Latin one was really cool. Maybe I'll have them reread it. That's fine. You can even leave them a voice message. And that's what these over here are. And you can see when you left them and you can set up a filter where, okay, I want um, my unit one and, you know, then my unit two, I want to see if there's anything for unit three is anything for that stage. And then it will show you if there's anything or not. So it's kind of interesting. It's not the most important thing, but as time goes on, I could see where people could use some of that. Um, we can always explain it again if you like, but um, it's basically a little bit of practicing. This makes it larger. If you have someone who needs the, the, the font larger, um, that's the bookmark. Some of this one just, you know, is make sure it's up to date. I don't really think that helps us very much. This is another way to go from stage to stage. So, all right. We're only five minutes over. That's not terrible. Not terrible, yeah. And if you think of any questions after this is over, you can always contact 
contact us at clctraining at cambridge.org. And we're more than happy to help you not just with Elevate, but with anything Cambridge related.